Hey, everybody, and welcome to the art and science of complex sales. And this is Paul Fuller, and I am on with uh, one of my favorite people in the sales world, Gretchen Gordon. And uh, Gretchen, there is one thing that you I've never told you about yourself, <laughs> is that uh, we flew out and we were on an airplane together to the OMG conference. I was so intimidated. <laughs> what? Oh, I, I feel was, bad. <laughs> no, no, you don't need to feel bad. I was intimidated because you're really good at what you do. And I was uh, just getting into sales consulting. And it was one of those things that was like, man, I've seen her name all over this OMG scorecard and all this stuff. And she's doing really good. It was one of those, holy shit, I need to get better moments. <laughs> anyway. Well, thank anyway. you for saying that. I had no idea. <laughs> oh no, it's the truth. It's the absolute truth. I, I appreciate uh, it. No, I really have, have uh, loved your work. And what I was hoping to do today is start at the basics. It's one one thing that we always uh, start with here. And you know, we've both been in sales for, for a while, but uh, it's a crazy game and everybody defines it a little bit differently. So tell me a little bit, what does sales mean to Gretchen Gordon? What it means to me now, and this was not what it meant when I first got into sales, is that it's really helping others get what they want or what they need. And that is truly my definition of sales. Sales is all about understanding what is going on with the other person, what they need for themselves or what they need for their company, and figuring out if what you bring to the table will help them accomplish their goals. And if it does, then uh, helping them understand how you can help them accomplish their goals. It's no more difficult than that. Yeah. How has that changed over time? Like you said, it's not Mm -hmm. what it is when you first got into it. So I am one of those weird sales consultants, experts, whatever you want to call it, that was not a natural born salesperson. You know, you you hear of people who had a paper route and, you know, and then they grew it and then they had people working for them and that type of thing. That's the total opposite of my sales background. I actually, you know, if you think about it, my first sales job was as a Girl Scout selling Girl Scout cookies. And while I loved everything about Girl Scouts, the camping projects, all those types of things, I was petrified of the Girl Scout cookie sale. And even the Thin Mints, (laughs) even the Thin Mints. And it's because it was it was the era where you walked around your neighborhood, knocked on the door, you asked your neighbors if they'd want to buy some Girl Scout cookies. But I was so wrapped up in my own head. And we, you know, we always had these contests and, you know, who sold the most cookies that I was focused on selling cookies, not making someone's day or making someone happy. I mean, you know, people wait for the Girl Scout cookie sale every year. So long story short, I quit Girl Scouts because of that because I was so petrified of, yes. So I got into sales, not because I was a, I want to be in sales, but I I got into it by accident. I actually was trying to run away from sales. (laughs) My first job out of college was a fluke. I, I got a job in sales at Procter & Gamble, not because I always wanted to, but because my roommate always wanted a job at Procter & Gamble. So I'm like, well, I'll go interview with Procter & Gamble and see if I can get a job. So I did hated that sales job as well because I was still focused on trying to sell stuff, trying to sell. Well, and, and I don't know if you'll find this funny or not, but I worked in the food products group. So I was selling cookies. I was <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> That's karma. So, yeah, it is karma. So miserable. Hated ev- I hated it. My favorite part of sales was in my car driving from one appointment to the the next. And mm-hmm. it's all because I was focused on me, not them. I was focused on trying to sell something, trying to get them to buy more cases, trying to get them to do something, as opposed to being focused on what's really important to the other guy. And it wasn't until my next sales job that uh, I had a great mentor and I figured out that that's really what it's about. It's asking better questions to understand what's really going on with the other party. If you can help them achieve their goals, great. And if you can't, yeah, part friends, no big deal. Yeah, I uh, I resonate with that so much. Like my first my first sales job, I was an SDR. I thought I thought it was about me and saying the perfect things. 
<laughs> right? And so the amount of pressure that that put on me was was immense because what it was about me, it was about being perfect. <laughs> it had nothing to do with the customer, right? like absolutely nothing to do with them. Every single customer then became somebody I feared because it was another chance to screw up, you know, and yeah. not that perfect thing. Yeah, no, uh, I totally connect with that completely. I mean, and that's, I was fearful of my customers because I was interrupting their day. And so I was approaching it as, you know, something I had to do, not that, oh, they should be happy to see me because I'm going to help them increase their profit per square foot in their store, or, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. Yep. No. So <laughs> I wasn't going to go this way, but you, we brought it up. So what do you tell, like, what do you tell young reps that are struggling with exactly that? Like, like how, how do you how do you coach someone when you find it that they're making it all about themselves? Well, I think there's really two things. I mean, we we get you know wrapped up in ourselves a lot. We get in our inside our own head, and um, you know, as you referenced with uh, OMG, right? I'm a I'm a big OMG disciple. It helps to uncover that objectively, which those tools do to figure out, okay, what are the impediments that are causing someone to lack confidence in a good sales conversation or be too focused on themselves or inside their head? And we can objectively analyze that. But also, how do you fix that then? I mean, that was really your question. How do you coach someone on that? And I think it comes down to starting first with a good repeatable process, following, you know, get, equip them with where this conversation might go and equip mm-hmm. them with a repeatable system, a roadmap, if you will, of what should you ask and what are you trying to find out to advance the conversation. And if you start there, that doesn't even really require any true sales skill. It just requires follow, you know, having the discipline to follow the process. And then you can work on coaching them around improving the level of the conversation. So start first with an accountability to a process. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so I'm going to give some context here because we both mentioned OMG and I don't think we gave context. <laughs> I think it, it makes sense to talk. So OMG provides one of the best tests that you'll ever see in terms of, uh, you can describe this better than I can. You sold a lot more OMG than I have, but <laughs> one of the best tests, one of the best tests in the world in terms of seeing where somebody is in terms of their sales effectiveness and either as a you know, current salesperson or as a prospective salesperson for an organization. Do you mind just sharing a little bit more about that and yeah. give some context? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So uh, it's really um, designed to be a predictive tool to predict uh, the level of success that an individual not just can have, but will have in a particular sales role, whether they're an existing salesperson or sales manager for that matter, salesperson, you know, needing to execute in a certain manner or as a candidate for a certain role. So that's what I mean. It, It measures the potential, I guess I would say, of the individual, both from a skill, it, you know, measures what they have now and what their skills are, but also what the potential is to grow those skills and their mindset around that. So that's, you know, objective management group is, um, like you said, probably the the most predictive tool on the market to be able to do that in a sales thing. So we just well, did a big commercial for them. <laughs> did you? <laughs> yeah. oh, we did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. You're welcome, Dave. Uh, (laughs) No, but one of the things that's interesting about what you said, though, is you have this, we have this test that can give the predictive, both the past and the predictive performance. And then one of the things that you said was tying our process around something to educate them with, Mm -hmm. right? So that's brilliant, especially for like a young salesperson to build that discipline. Do you have any examples of that that you do work with somebody on? Yeah. So I guess I would say... From the standpoint of how do we put that in place to to aid someone? And, and I have to admit that when I started my business in 2009, we didn't do any of that. It was really training and coaching. And that's evolved over time because I've determined that there's really only two reasons why salespeople fail. And it's either they don't do enough of the right things 
or they do enough of the right things, but they're not very good at it. So, <laughs> I mean, it's like, duh, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, I love it. It's brilliant. <laughs> So you have to start, you kind of have to separate the two, doing things well versus doing the right things. And so I think about process and a systematic approach and implementing a roadmap, whatever you want to call it, a sales process map is what we call it, mm-hmm. to help guide someone from point A to point B to point C to point D. And If you can separate that from, are they having good conversations? Are they asking enough questions? That will enable you to focus in on what the impediments are for a person. So like in for a young salesperson, they're just going to mimic what they see, what they hear, what maybe they have heard other people do. So if you can start with, okay, when you're having an initial conversation, this is what you're trying to find out. And let's create some questions that would be appropriate to ask. Not that you're scripting them necessarily, get them to use those questions in their own language. But if they understand why am I asking those questions, because I want to get from, you know, just a nice, we're having a conversation to what does the person need and, and how motivated are they to change what they're doing now? And can we help them get there? And so that's really what I mean. So um, uh, we do that all the time. We almost do it I guess I would say without exception, and that's not true. But when we're working with clients, it is nearly always necessary to help them refine what that process looks like and help them make it easier for their people to follow. And if you can, if you can do that, like I said, it doesn't really take quote unquote sales skills. It it takes away the perception that sales is all an art. And I know we talk about the art and science of complex sales. It isn't just art and it isn't just science. It's both of those things together. So this can give people a platform to know exactly where they're headed in the conversation. And then you can kind of let the art take over, right? Have a better conversation because you're not so worried about where am I going next? Yeah. I use the analogy and uh, used it for a while of uh, we're both in Columbus, right? I'm an Ohio state fan, but Ohio state can, they, they're really, really disciplined team. They know how to to call the right play and they practice like crazy to call a play. Right. And only because they practice like crazy to call a play and they know exactly how that, you know, how they want that play to run, are they able then to audible off of that play if it doesn't work and do something creative, right? So right. it gives them gives them the foundation to to be creative, right? We're not creating a and that's what I think of when you when you say that, like is it's like how how do we get somebody to a level where they can riff, where they can use their own words, where they can actually relate instead of being a an automaton, right? That's simply running a process. They they need a basis and a framework to be able to drive on top. Like when you dive into that sales process, do you have like a standard one that you use or do you dive in individually and help people just rip and replace and recover and define their sales processes? That's a great question. So we have a, I guess I would call a selling system, which is no different than, it's not like we invented selling, right? We didn't invent that. So it's probably no different than most other companies. You know, there's certain things that you need to know along the way. You need to know why they would do something. Why would they do something now? What has to be the return on investment to them, both from a quantitative standpoint and a qualitative standpoint? And how are they going to make a decision? Who's going to be involved? What kinds of decisions have they made in the past? What it propels them? You know, all those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. So there's a, a system to follow. What is important is is really the glue to get you answers to all those questions to figure out, you know, it, it's basically just a, a project of figuring out what is it that they want, how badly do they want it, and are we the folks that are going to help them get there? We customize that process for them, which is mostly customizing the questions you would ask Mm -hmm. and what are the important elements that determine whether a a customer or prospect is going to be more likely to choose you versus doing nothing or choose you versus somebody else. 
And so it's a combination of questions that people will put in their own words to propel along the path of figuring out, you know, it's like, it's like a mystery, right? Are we going to be a, and so that's what's the, well, that's what's fun about it. Is there something here that we can help with? And if not, it's still fun to have the conversation, right? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think um, that when people start bringing joy to sales and one of the things that just absolutely changed my view of sales and selling is when I actually started thinking of it as service and leadership rather than selling. And it, it, and it allowed me to, to bring joy to sales. Cause I'm like, well, heck I can do that. I can help somebody figure it out. You know, and it's just, all right, now let's just have a conversation around it. When I, when I thought about it as persuasion and saying the perfect thing at the perfect time and all that stuff, it gave me, it just wasn't what I wanted to do or be a part of. That's right. Um, so what, one of the things that I'm, I'm finding interesting in the, in, in the podcast series is when people define sales and we, and we, we tend to go off on all sorts of different routes, but is it's different definitions and then different views. People a lot of have different views on how sales has changed over the year. Mm-hmm. Like how selling is different now versus it was 10 years ago. Are you finding, are you finding that there's been a lot of change? Are you finding the more it changes, the more it stays the same? Probably the latter. Uh, you know, I've been in sales for uh this is really gonna date me almost 40 years, 36 years. And uh, you started when you you started when you were two and a half. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> I wish. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's still about. I mean, obviously, and there's been a lot of of stuff out there. Let's just say that marketing, you know, big push to have marketing do part of the sales. And that there is truth to the fact that people have access, obviously, to a lot more information. They might be making conclusions about a service provider versus another service provider based on, you know, information they can, that is available to them. But the reason I say it's, it's the same is it's still fundamentally, especially complex sales. It's still fundamentally about connecting with people and understanding their motivations, understanding their fear, understanding, you know, what's gone on in the past, what have they done successfully to fix whatever problem they have and what have they failed at and connecting as a human. And as much as we can use AI to, you know, say what keywords should you be saying in a sales conversation and as much as you can use technology to find targets Sales is still essentially, at least complex sales, which is what we focus on as well, is still conversations between people. Whether you're selling, you know, B2C or B2B, it's still conversations uh, with people. And that hasn't changed at all. I think that what has changed is there's still, uh, there is more skepticism than there used to be. And what's changed is you have to be even more real. You cannot be scripted and you cannot do the things, all the tips and tricks of, you know, use their name a whole bunch and then they'll like you more. People, you know, people are so... Now Gretchen, now Gretchen, (laughs) come on now, you can't tell me that one's dying. (laughs) <laughs> but people are so over that, right? Because they they can spot it a mile away. And maybe they couldn't back, you know, in the day, so to speak. But people just want to be dealt with in a real fashion. And that's really how you differentiate yourself. There is so much noise out there, I guess I would say that. And since there is so much access to so much information, so many service providers, et cetera, that you do have to differentiate. And the only way you differentiate is by having real conversations with people. That's fantastic. Recently, we did a really good, really good webinar on essentially that, which is how do we use and so many people use and try to use tech to kind of replace the conversation, replace that. I refer to the conversation as the fundamental building block, the fundamental currency <laughs> in B2B complex sales. Like that's my my thought, right? Because conversations build to what relationships, relationships build to giving more information and being able to actually help each other. So many, so much of the tech stack today has been developed is about taking time out of those conversations and taking 
people out of those conversations. Right. I think it's so much more important that enables that enables the conversation and enables the actual flow of information more effectively instead of removing and making a bunch of robots because it's human. I mean, it's human to human, especially in in the B2B complex sale. I'm not talking, we're not selling uh, $6 widgets on Amazon. It's... Um, well, actually, I was, as you were talking about, you know, the real conversations and uh, differentiation and that type of thing, I I, uh, I actually read a stat recently that talks about the fact that personalized experience is table stakes. So, mm-hmm. and uh, the stat came from Twilio segment state of personalization report in 2020 from 2022, which... I don't actually know what they do and who they are, but that's that's where it came from. That 62% of consumers of you know services say that a brand will lose their loyalty if they deliver an unpersonalized experience, which is up from 45% in 2021. So the expectation is that you won't just say the words and sell something to me or mm-hmm. just service me the way you'd service everybody, but that you'll actually understand me and care about me and be able to provide services that will help me in a in a customized way. And so I think that that drives a lot of how I think about in a complex sale, you cannot use tech to specifically, you know, speed up or expedite how the conversation goes or how the sale goes. Um, Certainly you can use tech to identify targets, to identify intent of, you know, Mm. you know, there's all kinds of tools out there now that help folks understand when people are looking for certain products and services. But as far as actually connecting to the, like what's going on in here, you know, inside or in here with a prospect, uh, that takes conversation. You can't uncover that with technology, I don't think. No, I'm I'm completely with you. I, it's it's where we we align so well in terms of process process and tech. I think technology is amazing for us to walk a process and manage that process. And actually, I love it when it actually enables me to communicate. Like if you were my potential customer, communicate to you how we're going to be walking this road together. I think that's brilliant because it just gives that map, it gives that outline that, yeah. that we were talking about earlier that can enable confidence. When I think it it tries to replace a conversation, I think it fails miserably for the most part, right? It's, I, it's, no, uh, I agree completely. I agree completely. I, I don't want to talk to a chatbot. I yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know it's a chatbot, and I and they have no emotion, <laughs> and I don't want to talk to them. But you know, it, your point about that is something that intertwines with what I was talking about previously, which is having a sales process, having technology support that like membrane does. So customizing it so that you can have fill in the blanks. Like, what do I do next? I found out that they have this need. What do I do next? Technology can absolutely enable that. Producing a repeatable process that keeps the salesperson on course and then frees up their mind. I think you used the word to be creative is exactly it, right? Just have a conversation. Don't worry about, ah, where am I going next? Let technology serve that purpose for you. There seems to be a renaissance. Like I don't I think it's a, a backlash against all the tech stack and all the <laughs> the but it actually it seems to be a renaissance of having real conversation. Like we have to do it via Zoom, unfortunately, but it seems that that is something what people missed. <laughs> like I know <laughs> I missed it like crazy during 2020 and 20, you know, but yeah. You know that that is it's uh, it feels like it's being reintroduced. It's 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 no secret sauce. It simply is right. The ability to have a, a really good conversation and understand what you need and how I can help. One of the things I definitely want to get into with you is is uh, switch topics a little bit. But what are some of the biggest challenges that you're seeing today out there in in the sales profession and sales market? And yeah, let's leave it at that. Well, I think because we've had such a robust economy for so long that a lot of people have misconstrued a lot of sales and growth with expertise and skill at selling. 
So, gotcha. you know, phones ringing off the hook, business is coming in, we can't keep up with it. And so what we're finding is that a lot of people are feeling under stress, salespeople and managers and leaders alike, because all of a sudden things are cooling a little bit. And instead of the pie getting bigger, we're asking our sales teams to go get a bigger piece of the pie. So they have to be more competitive. They have to be able to differentiate where for the last several years, they haven't had to, right? It just, you know, Mm -hmm. and so that's where people have to kind of sharpen the sword in terms of, uh, okay, go back to the basics, What is it that I need to be talking about? What do my customers and prospects care about? And I need to be asking better questions, be more insightful. That's how I can differentiate myself and my company. And I might need to work harder than I have had to work or work in a different way than I've had to work in the last several years because the phone isn't ringing quite as much. And so I need to be better at going out and attracting new business whether that's through referrals or whether that's through just going out and hunting. And so I think that that's a, that's been a struggle for that we're seeing uh, across the board. How are people addressing it? Like how are management and leadership teams addressing that right now? And how are you seeing that, that play out? A lot of them are uh, wringing their hands. (laughs) <laughs> and then a lot so of them, it's the best way to get something done exactly right? and then and that's a lot that's not actually a knock on anybody because <laughs> yeah. I, I understand what that feels like we all we all get into that point where we're like oh shit, what do i do now yeah but but i think also from leadership uh, there's a you know maybe renewed emphasis on oh i need to double down on marketing and that'll solve everything if the you know pipeline has dried up so to speak of leads then it's it's a little bit too late to rely on marketing right mm-hmm. it, you know that do marketing you know ramp it up when things aren't dire i'm not saying that things are necessarily dire for a lot of companies however what they're starting to consider is maybe we don't have all the right people doing it. Maybe we need different skill sets than what we had to just, um, you know, deal with the demand that we had. So that's what we're seeing a lot. We're we're very busy because there is this kind of cooling off, I guess I mm-hmm. would say. And so it's like, ooh, help us skill up our people, put processes in place. What should we be holding them accountable to? Those types of things. That's no, that's good to hear. Could I the worst thing, and I, I started a sales as a service business in 2007, right? So that wasn't a great time. <laughs> it was we had had that lull between you know the the dot com yeah. hit, and then everything started getting really good, right, for a while, and it was the same type of thing, and then boom, right, 2008, 2009, 2010, but. What I saw at that time, and I think we're seeing again, is is the smart money banked on improving sales process, improving salespeople, doubling down on that, finding people that would be with them for the long haul, and building building that expertise into them. And the the rash money threw a bunch of it at, well, I just need to pour a bunch more money into marketing and and very similar to what you're saying. So one of the things I was starting that company at that time and I was like, well, the people that the people that truly invested in their front end and their process, it's actually why we went with a dedicated sales model. We would assign and train and manage a dedicated salesperson for an organization or up to three or four or five, right? Because the ones that went with like the next appointment setter always came back saying, this sucks. <laughs> I can't get any more leads. I can't get any more leads. I can't get any more. And, and so I really like where you're going in terms of investing in talent, investing in people, investing in process, making the smart choices that are really hard to make instead of the easy choices. And I, I'm not bashing market because everybody's got to do it, but the easy right. choices is, is uh, let's just pour more money on the same thing that used to work. Exactly. Well, you know, the other thing that a lot of companies overlook 
and I started my business in 2009 when it was, you know, at the depths of Mm -hmm. following the recession and it was bad. And uh, it was a boom time for our business. It it took off uh, tremendously because there were so many company owners that were like, hey, can you work with my folks? Because phone quit ringing and, and now I need hunters. And they were just, you know, account managers. And so there's always this like, oh, we got to go get more. We got to go get more. We got to go get more. But also in these times, what can be very, very beneficial is to look at your existing client base and work with the folks who maybe aren't as successful at hunting and go, well, what what else can we do for these customers that we have and really focus on the existing customers and, you know, have, um, you know, account-based growth and and cross sell upsell do other things for them that can you know frequently i mean we talk about it a lot but in the last several years there's been so much demand that um maybe we've forgotten about that a little bit that like hey let's just you know make hay with our existing clients double down on sales skills double down on sales training double down on existing clients and how you're servicing them and helping them and uh I think I just summarized. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, I I completely agree. And and it's not that hunting is going by the wayside either. It's like you still have to, it's just, it's harder. So we have it to is do hard. It's harder to get through. We have to do it more effectively, right? Right. Well, we have spent a lot of time together and I truly appreciate it. Thank you so much. One of the things I, I want to definitely do is is let people know how to get in touch with you. So how can people find Gretchen Gordon if they love your ideas? So a couple different ways, just go to braveheartsales.com. That's our website. And my email address is gordon at braveheartsales. So that's super easy. And I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. So you can find us there too. (laughs) Do you connect with people on LinkedIn when they reach out to you? Uh, Most everybody I connect with. If people reach out, I will connect with you unless it is uh, clearly just a random reach out just to expand someone's network. <laughs> a true, yes, a true salesperson. We, we got to connect and have relationships. I have to ask one last question before I let you go, though. How did you get the name Braveheart? Uh, is it William Wallace? A little bit. Um. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, but I exactly, my yeah. exactly. It's a silly, it's a silly reason. Okay. So when I started the business, uh, before I started it, I was already, I had a couple projects I was working on and I needed a company name because someone needed a proposal for something. And I had been given advice. Don't ever name your business after yourself. And, um, I, I had had another business that um, used my Scottish heritage as part of the name. So I went through all the things that could be Scottish, you know, tartan, you know, all kinds of things. And it's like, it just didn't make sense. So I just randomly picked it out of the air because literally I needed a name. And uh, so that's what it was. And so then we've turned it into something, which is Braveheart is really uh, a person who fights for a noble cause. And that's kind of how we view sales. I love it because it's how I view sales too. I think it's, I think it's after being in it for a while, after fighting like hell to not be in it and understand it, then understanding what it, what it truly is about. I think it's one of the best professions in the world because I want to get to talk to people like you (laughs) and too, it's like, we get to, we get to go out there every single day and shine bright, right? Yeah. And regardless, and you have to, that's a, that's a requirement of the job, right? It's like, you got to go shine bright. You got to bring your best foot forward. You got to serve, you got to lead, you got to help people solve problems. And uh, it's brilliant. So thank you so much. I truly appreciate this time together and uh, people reach out to Gretchen. She rocks. Can we have you back? Absolutely. would love to come back. This was fun. Uh, anytime, you know, I can talk about this stuff for, for hours on end. So it's been great. I really appreciate it, Paul. And hopefully people picked up a nugget. All right. We'll talk soon. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, All right. Paul.